know what they say. There's two types of people in this world. Stupid people, and stupid people who are aware they're stupid. Yes, it's a generalization, but not every person is equipped with the same skill set. Even the most quote-unquote intelligent people will be ignorant with something. Does a rocket scientist know the Mayan language? Until they dedicate time to learning it, they would be considered dumb by at least someone out there. But it's relative and opinionated to make claims. Everyone's different. You can learn something new every day. Or, ignorance is bliss. Don't let it bother you. However, I could be stupid with my perspective. There's always a debate on objectivity. Something objectively stupid. Even with the most concoctive talent, with as much research as possible, a person who studies stupidity down to its most raw level fathomable. Stupid not only put on full blast, but full on fetishized to an exploitive degree. A character that can only be conceived in fiction. A man so stupid, he only relies on bodily instincts, despite being able to comprehend speech. There is nothing going on inside that head. What head? That, the head that's slowly coming towards you? Those lifeless, vacant eyes, mouth slightly agape with that boater hat firmly placed upon that empty cranium. Stupidity so ingrained into his identity, he legally changed his last name to Stupid. A general idea personified in the character known as Stanley Stupid, played by Thomas Arnold in the 1996 Jonathan Landis masterpiece, The Stupids. Cinema has been no stranger for exaggerating clumsy characters for comedic effect. But with the punkish counterculture attitude of the 1990s, there was a trend of subversive and intentionally stupid comedies. But at the height of the stupid craze, a film releases with no holds barred. We put the dumb back in stupid. It reads like a form of absurdist poetry. And you know, it was so polarizing. It was revered by the general public. Reviewers thinking they were so clever reviewing a film called The Stupids and calling it just that. Stupid. Cause that's what it is. It's stupid to the core. And it's not even stupid in a clever way. It's full on brain dead stupidity with little substance of any kind. As American as apple pie and twice as smart. <laughs> I'm losing my mind, but that's the film's goal. It wants me to indulge and become a mindless drone much like the film's protagonist. Do you commend the film for being honest and sticking to its stupid core? Or do you write it off as being as stupid as it intensifies the pain within? I do not know. But like all good artistic works, a conflicting opinion makes it worth discussion. But in order to review or experience this thing, known as the stupids. I must become stupid myself. Understand and analyze what little brain activity sparks behind that glazed stare. How low can your IQ be where you can no longer be considered human? The subtle existential dread thought crossing into his mind where he'll never improve, never get better. He is doomed to be an imbecile for the rest of his life. He can never feel sympathy, remorse, memories of his family, his friends, every person he holds near and dear to him wastes away into a flavorless paste. He keeps smiling through because a stupid is as a stupid does. Then again, I could be stupid in my observation. In the spring of 1974, a simple children's book series came into fruition, titled The Stupids. The books follow the comedic misadventures regarding a family who always does things the wrong way. They sleep upside down, he puts socks on his ears, the kid mows the carpet, it's simple introductory absurdist humor for children. Or an indoctrination tool as it makes a farce out of people who don't fit in society's expectations. And someone from New Line Cinema wondered what it would look like on the big screen. The world is in grave danger. And there's only one family who can save it. I've uncovered the crime of the century. That's what it would look like. The stupid. And this is what the box office turnout looked like. 
But even despite lifting a majority of the jokes directly from the source material, this film in no way encompasses the spirit of the books. The simplicity and innocence are gone, and all we get here is a disturbing character study of a man driven to his breaking point. Because there's a difference in being stupid and having unresolved mental illnesses. Since this movie's a bit obscure, let me give you a quick overgeneralization of the plot. After accidentally leaving the trash out on their curb, the stupid family has their garbage stolen from them! Oh no! Someone's stolen our garbage again! And Stanley vows on his life to get it back. The plot spirals out of control with theories of government conspiracy, excessive mental gymnastics, and wacky misunderstandings. I'm calling from the police station, Mrs. Stupid. We uh, have your children here, ma'am. Oh my god, it's true! The police have kidnapped my children! Yeah, you know, first off, I wouldn't call this stupid. The signs of deteriorating mental health are right here. Observing the house they live in, which basically looks ripped straight out of a cartoon, looks perfectly clean! No hoarding is currently taking place. Yet. Once it's in Stanley's hand, he owns it forever. And yeah, both him and his wife seem very upset about it. They're only starting to have this attachment problem now. Oh, I left the trash out overnight. Mrs. Stupid is stuck in her weekly routine and hasn't adapted to their new way of thinking. They want to get their garbage back because they want to get their garbage back. Stanley Stupid doesn't need excuses. Whatever. So he sets up a decoy trash can in his front lawn to see if anyone would take it. And not including the opening credits, 90 seconds into this movie, we are already kickstarting the plot. What in the world? I don't know any garbage trucks that come out at night or go to the same block literally the next day. Or garbage men that wear gas masks. The, the, the film's rules aren't established at this point. And once it is... It's not consistent in the slightest. Maybe it's supposed to disorient the viewers, much like Stanley's descent into complete madness. I've lost it! Especially with this clever scene here, where in Stanley's attempt to chase the garbage truck, he passed it off the chance of falling behind in a car, instead settling for a pair of rollerblades, as rollerblades have more wheels than a car. See, this shows that he's capable of simple mathematics and can recognize basic problem solving. However, the answer is completely wrong. It's like a child doing the tall glass experiment. It's recognized in psychology circles of our young developing mind. Two cups of water of equal or less value are placed in front. Which has more? The child answers the obvious one, but it's not until the one with less water is poured into a taller glass where the child answer changes, despite it happening right in front of the child's face. Will we call the child stupid if we recognize that as normal behavior? No! With mental regression, we get memory loss, motives and opinions that change on a whim. Even intelligence can get confused and impair rational thinking. This impairment ends up bleeding into his personal life, because the next day, Stanley's offspring are finally introduced. Buster and Petunia Stupid, both who are clearly worried about their guardian's absence. And you know what? They're also suffering from mental health issues too! Cause the first conclusion these kids jump to is that their father has been kidnapped. I got up early to walk my fish and he was already gone. He's been kidnapped? Someone malicious came in the night is maliciously trying to attack your family. But memory blanking from the possible dyslexic child, I can relate, ends up writing a note easily misinterpreted by the mother. <laughs> Jumping to conclusions or even simple misunderstandings is actually a running theme in this film. Not only did Stanley do this with the garbage the day prior, with each misunderstanding, it's always interpreted as negative. For one reason or another, this entire family is paranoid. They think that the world is out to get them and everyone's watching their every move. Yes, stupidity is usually portrayed as being more clueless, but usually clueless in a sense of ignoring danger. This family sees everything as a possible threat. Even the glimpse of a simple crossing guard spirals into an erratic frenzy. For example, once Stanley finally gets to the garbage dump, he disguises himself as a bush. Though a failed attempt to properly hide himself, the possibility of potential danger is sensed, and he tries to avoid it. Poor fools thought it was a bush. While at the dump, Stanley accidentally stumbles across a real government conspiracy. It's there where he observes the military is secretly... I don't know, it really isn't clearly specified. Something about weapons. Our country refused my promotion, Lieutenant. They have only themselves to blame now. 
Oh, because he didn't get a promotion. It's just to prove something. Okay, so the villains are unhinged as well. But surprisingly out of character. Seeing this, Stanley ditches the Bush costume and greets the general for being there. Yes, these are pretty much the most dangerous people in the movie. They serve the role as the antagonist of the film, but Stanley's completely unfazed. In Stanley's head, the military themselves are the only people Stanley will trust other than his family. And no, they want him dead. Stanley doesn't even realize that. But it begs the question, what brainwashing did the military do to Stanley for him to trust them? Considering Stanley owns a house and manages to support a family, makes you think that this mental illness isn't hereditary, but instead it stems from a traumatic experience. Stanley is indoctrinating his family with these beliefs out of complete concern of their safety. Being brainwashed by the media is one thing. Another thing is repressing trauma so deeply you start to develop absurdist delusions. Something broke this man. Something broke this entire family. Surprisingly, with all this baggage, the film downplays its thematic elements. The editing and music give the movie a more lighthearted tone. There's clear mental distress in our main cast. Like, they're so distressed, they're even talking to themselves. Note to self, I must buy handheld tape recorder. Then I will no longer be speaking into the garage door opener. I've uncovered the crime of the century. Breaking the fourth wall is a storytelling style. Sometimes it's for comedic effect. Sometimes it's to convey information to the audience. But in real life, people don't usually talk to themselves when no one's around to hear them. They think about it. Well, take a look at this. In the next scene, there is a point where we hear exactly what Stanley is thinking about. Strange indeed are the workings of fate. How could I have known that today I would wander into the jaws of some kind of super crime? Including this tidbit of information, the film establishes inner monologues as a storytelling device, meaning the muttering to oneself. Perhaps they do believe they're talking to someone, even if it's all on their head. The paranoia is developing into symptoms of psychosis and possible schizophrenia. Like, there's a clear meltdown taking place right here, and the military is all like... And very, very smart. Kill him. What?! Sure. I completely understand seeing this freak out would be somewhat threatening, but this isn't a secret base! You are just at the fucking dump! It's publicly accessible! People come out of these places and drop stuff off on a daily basis! You don't think for one minute that this could be easily some crackhead having a bad trip! So, like anyone would, they give him a free car! And to think I just wanted to ride back to town! And they will attempt to kill him on his ride home? I know that the film is trying to screw with my mind, but it's working a little too well. But in classic cartoony slapstick fashion, Stanley unintentionally outsmarts the bad guys trying to kill him by unintentionally killing them himself. Actually, not just Stanley and the bad guys. The other family members cause damage too. Not to bad guys though, but to just innocent bystanders. Yeah, that woman's fucking dead now. These characters aren't just threats to the bad guys, they're threats to society as a whole. They're too stupid to feel empathy or remorse. They don't even realize what they're doing. And after causing possibly thousands of dollars in property damage, we cut to outer space randomly and... There, there's aliens in this movie. And they swear on an oath to kill Stanley Stupid? Just because a random newspaper said aliens pilots pick nose? And no, this is not a fantasy sequence, by the way. These aliens actually exist in the film's universe. I I'd say this movie is unhinged, but it's even more unhinged is that they set this up, create these funky costumes, just to have them disappear for the rest of the movie, only to come back for a quick gag before the credits, where Stanley, of course, doesn't notice them and ends up outsporting them without even looking, just like everyone else in this goddamn movie. It's the same joke. And you know what? This is too jarring of a plot point to discard, which reminds me. I also forgot to mention something just as jarring. Probably the number one reason not to watch these films under the influence. These claymation things are creepy. They rarely show up in the movie, and when they do, they demand the viewer's full attention. Now, if you remember the Stupid's book series, if you look at the illustrations, there seems to be members of the Stupid's family you might have not known about. Their cat and dog. They translated the cartoon design from the books 
to near perfection. But what doesn't leave to the screen is the context of these pets. In the books, you could easily point out that they do background work. They tend to be the ones that help out the stupids when they fumble around and mess up. In the film, they barely do anything. They're just kind of there to vibe, you know? The dog gives them the keys at one point. That's it. Who knows? Maybe they do background work off camera. Maybe they do Stanley's taxes or some shit. He wouldn't know what that is. He seemed to have forgotten what a garbage truck was. Something tax money pays for. Oh, something that wasn't forgotten though was... <gasps> Stanley's backstory. Are we finally going to find out what drove him up the wall? Stanley Stupid was a courier for the US government. I mean, he's still misunderstanding what his job entails, but oh wait, paranoia finally strikes him after he finds a letter that looks different than the others. Return to sender. Stanley, who believes this to be a living being, goes and asks his boss, who doesn't even bother correcting him. What is it now, Stanley? Seems like an incredible amount of letters are being delivered to somebody named Sender. Who is this Sender? Lazily, they ignore his paranoid ramblings, not knowing that Stanley will soon create a giant fantasy scenario in his head where he convinces himself Sender is an evil demon from hell, played by Christopher Lee, set on world domination, not only to steal all the world's letters, but steal everyone's garbage too. To rob an entire nation of its Garbage. And since the stupids recluse themselves from the outside world, everyone else in the world is in on this as well, with the complicated mental gymnastics saying that everyone and everything is collaborating with this sender guy, this random waiter at a Chinese restaurant, he's in on it, the crossing guard who doesn't even have a line, they're in on it too! Stanley Stupid has discovered our secret. At last, a foe worthy of matching wits with... I like how this is framed as a ridiculous fantasy sequence, while the aliens aren't. This is only established so Stanley can be the savior of his own story. He'll repeat it so much in his head, he'll start to believe it. Perhaps this possibly triggered in his mind from a neglectful childhood, as he never got the proper validation. He personally doesn't like his trash being stolen, and wants to prevent his pain and anguish to be pushed onto other people. Even if getting rid of curbside pickup would be detrimental for many involved, especially the environment, the gesture is greatly appreciated. To help out his fellow man in an act of selflessness, while someone with a lower IQ would be more interested in being more self-serving. Let me jump to another part. The area of the film where Stanley's captured. He's tied to a chair and the military general attempts to intimidate him. Confusingly enough, Stanley does not look distraught. Did they drug him? He looks like he's on heavy, heavy stimulants. He's just smiling away, even though they're about to shoot him. Stanley has not made these faces in other scenes. However, in intense stressful situations, depending on the trauma, one might dissociate heavily, overriding the current situation in their heads to avoid emotional distress. One might continue to smile, keep up repetitive actions like flapping hands or speaking a phrase. Another tragic dissociation happens in the planetarium scene, where the family's reunited and searching for Sender. And since it's dark, Stanley believes that he and his daughter had died. One false move and we could end up dead. <laughs> Oh my god, it's happened! You might laugh at it, but I think of it as something tragic. A possible moment of disconnecting himself. A meditative stance. Stanley's long desire is to be at peace. Away from the stressors of life is probably why he welcomes death with open arms. Any attempt to keep the mind at peace. Stanley is not a confrontational person. While he's alone, he makes judgments that everyone's out to get him. But actually interacting with people face to face is a different story. In fact, he's quite friendly. Here's your fare, and a little extra for yourself. Thank you, sir. What's the occasion? It's just good to be home. Whether he puts on a mask to avoid conflict, he will still get up, shake their hand, and greet them with the utmost sincerity. His social skills may get awkward, but he never acts shy or afraid. He practices these conversations in his head, and with enough dissociation, he's confident and relaxed. Even at the end of the film, where Stanley confronts who he believes to be Sender, doesn't throw any punches. Instead, he fights them with a far better weapon. His tongue. Well, my friend, it seems you lost. I certainly am. And with his simple but excellent persuasion skills, 
he reasons with Sender to change his ways. Yeah, yeah, that's not Sender, by the way. He just assumes he is, and both of them are, like, misunderstanding each other. Yeah, this plot is a little too convenient for my taste, but who knows if this whole thing is in Stanley's head at the end of the day. Is that why the aliens exist? Does the rest of his family even exist? Oh, shit. I personally haven't really talked about the other members of the family. And why would I? They kind of work as a hive mind. Watching the film, it's almost immediate you realize there's little to no distinction between them at all. They're not stupid enough in their own unique ways. Any dialogue from any character can be swapped out on a whim. Is this lazy writing? I would say not. If they all share the same personality, and the family is so convinced that the sender delusion is real, they don't even question it one bit. Even in Stanley's weird fantasy sequence, Stanley was aware about the Chinese restaurant that his kids went to, or the crossing guard that his wife saw. They were all in the sender flashback, something that he concocted himself. Let's head back to the planetarium scene, where Stanley laughs to himself at the idea of his wife dying in a fiery car crash. Don't worry, honey. They'll be joining us soon enough, the way your mom drives. <laughs> Could that really have happened? Is that why he wants to die so much? But accepting death is far different than wanting it to happen to you. Primal instincts kick in, and Stanley has to survive. After the military attached a ticking time bomb to the car they gave him. Stanley experiences a near-death situation. He only got out of the car trying to squash a bee that showed up on a steering wheel. Out of complete coincidence, he saved his life. If he didn't decide to do that, he would have been dead by now. Just like his wife. It's a shock to the system, and even though he may brush his close call off like nothing, new mental scars arise. Not even five minutes later, the next time he enters a car, he forgets how to drive it. The previous scene he drove with no effort, but now he freezes up as a fresh slab of PTSD kicks in. What if his own car explodes too? Oh my god! And after he tries to kiss the engine better, in an attempt to stall the drive until his mental state can take it, something revolutionary happens. Wait a minute, what am I doing? I cooked up some insane conspiracy theory and put myself in the middle of an illegal weapon field with some of the world's most dangerous men. I've risked my life and the lives of my family in a scheme that makes absolutely no sense at all. It doesn't last for long, but this 10 seconds changes the entire trajectory of the whole film. Wait, what am I doing? This mental breakdown is out of his control. He's self-aware of what he's doing is not right, and yet he continues to act it out. It isn't until he resorts to shock therapy where he bounces back to his true self. How is it possible for a storyteller to write a character so tragic, so deeply affecting? I just... Even with my analysis, I am doing it a disservice, and it's only tragic if you've seen the film before. You all know what I'm talking about. As well, if you've seen the movie, you might have realized I haven't talked about its most iconic scene. And yes, I have saved the best for last. With all this information that I've been telling you, it all comes flooding down to this very pivotal moment. With the second act, there's really no stakes to be had. The stupid family's bumbling around different set pieces, different buildings. One of these buildings being a television station. There's a little bit of skits with different talk shows. But one last talk show shows up. This isn't just any type of talk show. This is something I would call the stupidest form of entertainment known to all of humankind. Even stupider than the movie we're watching right now. A television show that exploits mental illness for entertainment and profit. You know, your Dr. Phil's, Jerry Springer's. It's all spectacle to see someone losing their minds. You know those let people enjoy things or every taste of entertainment is subjective? I 100% stand by that. There's only one condition. Do not make it this. Even Stanley Stupid, which the film constantly pokes fun at, is portrayed as the dumbest clown on planet Earth. When he's thrown onto the show, he doesn't answer the question with sincerity. Instead, he makes a farce out of it and trolls them. I have my own grandpa. 
You're your own grandpa. Many, many years ago when I was one. Stanley breaks out into a gut-wrenching musical number of his own iteration of I'm my own grandpa. Was this where the trauma stemmed from? Too much family marrying in? Making him his own grandpa? Does he consider himself his own grandpa for how much his parents relied on inbreeding? No. I'd argue. This is where I personally speculate the movie gets meta. Something if known shades this scene into a whole new level of irony. A theory that may breathe life into the film's baffling conception. Does anyone know who Tom Arnold is anyway? Outside of this movie, what did he really do? Apparently he was a big enough star, he was paid $5 million for this role. But why not $6 million? He refused to do the nude scene. What? Tom! Tom! W what do you mean by that? Was there another cut of the film we don't know about? Was it called The Hordies? I, I guess he was in True Lies, which that was the most expensive movie he ever made at the time. And he was in a few episodes of Roseanne. Oh, he, he was Roseanne's ex-husband? Please, I'll take acting lessons and I'll look real professional and stuff. No. Tom Arnold stars in the Jackie Thomas Show. Now, I'm a Zoomer. I don't even know what a Roseanne is. Was he really that big of a deal? He was a star of two sitcoms, both named after him. Sitcoms that almost nobody remembers or bothered to archive. Oh, it looked like there was just a lot of heavy drama with their divorce. Roseanne is filing for divorce. Insiders say Tom may have taken up with another woman. Whatever. It, it was so big that it was adapted into a television movie. The, that's, that's just so pathetic. And this was two years before the stupids, by the way. But does that mean that most of this career stems from socialite culture? Was the marketing saying Tom Arnold is stupid meant to give the people who follow the drama an ego boost? Paranoia, depression, psychosis, memory loss can possibly develop if you live in a world where everyone's watching your every move. People who jump to conclusions on stuff that should be kept private. Now, I'm speculating, but Tom Arnold, not Stanley Stupid, but Tom Arnold himself, I'm speculating, breaks character and sings I'm my own grandpa from the bottom of his hardened heart. Giving the biggest middle finger in cinematic history towards everyone who indulged in this exploitive celebrity obsession chapter in his life. Finally, the audience is under his control. They're the real ones being played. Except this guy, he's out of sync, but he corrects himself. I'm my own grandpa is sung with such sincerity and clarity. There's malice seeping through every syllable that passes through his lips and he's enjoying every second of it. This might be a fictional movie, but a fictional movie where he managed to get the last laugh. Then again, I could be stupid in my observation. This could really just be a below average family comedy for the 90s, with its only purpose being a fun diversion for an hour and a half. While the movie does excel in fun costume design, the film's humor is repetitive and most of the time falls flat. The pacing is choppy, characters are shallow, world building is inconsistent. Even with the film's absurd premise, it strangely feels held back in a way. The highlights of the movie was just seeing how crazy or even how far they could have taken something. And if it was their strong suit, they should have committed to it. The film meanders and sets the bar quite high early on. It definitely dips and loses steam near the middle area, and it doesn't really recover, making it pretty uneven and underwhelming as a whole. The stupids as a whole isn't very good. In fact, I'd say it's quite bad. Oh no. But I don't think I'd ever forget it. The existence of the film is already funny on an ironic level, and I'm sure we all have one of those movies that's fun to rip on and make jokes about, but after doing that for so long, you know, unironic love and passion start to develop. I'd even go as far as saying, a full-on obsession develops. A piece of media that came across so baffling, it started to cloud my thinking, consume my personality. Hell, I spent a year on and off the script whether I liked it or not. I had to get the word out. Because the more I dug into this thing, the more parallels I saw comparing it to my own life. Much like an avant-garde piece of cinema, it may not be fun to watch, or even an intentionally a chore to sit through. But it manages to sustain a lifelong impression. 
It may be funny to break down these flaws, ironically praising it as some sort of deeper masterpiece, but it's not. The film had played me. The film is actually really stupid. The film is spouting nonsense, and I was doing the same thing. <laughs> you can make a movie sound way smarter, or way dumber than it actually is. Because, in the end... It really all is relative.